I know. That I bought for you. Hello everyone and welcome back to Cooking and Kids. As always, it's so good to take you with us on our travels. In this episode, we'll continue to explore beautiful Turkey. All this walking by the sea can sure work up an appetite. So my friend Denise is taking me to a special place to introduce me to some of traditional Turkish dishes. Yes, oh, and the beans, patlijan, beans and uh, baked plant. beans, right? Yeah. During this amazing food tasting, I'm going to try to pick one favorite dish. And then when I come back home, I'm going to try to create that recipe together with you. Out of all the dishes that we tried, grilled octopus remains my absolute favorite. Seafood was amazing, but my favorite dish ends up being a dessert. This is a traditional Turkish dessert. It's a candied pumpkin with a touch of uh, kaimak, which is a thick cream and some chopped walnuts. This dessert was truly amazing and now that I'm back home, I'm going to try to recreate it with you and to present you with the ways and recipe so that you and your family can make it too. Turkey is well known for its desserts and one of the most known is lokum. Uh, this is lemon uh, juice, lemon lokum with pistachio and cover, okay. covered with the coconut. Okay. And there's uh, like this, for example, it looks like sushi roll, but uh, it's from uh, lokum. It boiled from the goat milk and inside they put it halva. Oh it's my. sesame halva. Yeah, you should definitely try it also. Oh, thank you. Thank you. All right, saffron. On the top of the pomegranate lokum with pistachio, there is a saffron. Like, is the okay, um, all my friends, this is just another reason to travel and go see the world. If not for the sightseeing, if not for the history, come for food. Turkey is amazing. Now I'm tempted to make this on my own. But before we get to the kitchen, I want to take you on a quick tour and show you some of the places I have seen in Turkey on this particular trip and some of the things that I have learned along the way. We're off to visit ancient city of Ephesus, which had a long tradition of being a center of religious pilgrimage. Right above the ancient ruins is the House of Virgin Mary. The tiny house was discovered in the 19th century by a French priest following a series of revelations that appeared to a Catholic nun who, by the way, never visited Turkey. Today, both Christians and Muslims rent their house of Virgin Mary as a place of pilgrimage. It is thought that Virgin Mary have spent the last years of her life in these tranquil mountains. The structure that stands on the site now is only partially from the period during which Mary would have lived. However, a small baptismal pool close by has been dated back to apostolic age. While the bottom half of the Virgin Mary's house is original, the top has been restored with an effort to maintain as much of the original appearance as possible. 
Each year, over 700,000 visitors come to visit this holy ground and pray to Virgin Mary. Like many people who will be coming here to uh, send their praise to heaven and to Mother Mary, I too will light up a candles for the wealth, for the health of my children and prosperity of the family. So uh, no matter which religion you're from and what your beliefs are, places like these are very humbling. And um, we have all kinds of people visiting uh, this place uh, and pilgrimage. People from Mexico, I just heard a lot of people uh, speaking Spanish. Uh, people from different countries and different religions are here uh, joined in a prayer for something good. Every family has a prayer and a wish. And it's wonderful to see how people can unite over um, something simple as this, uh, a story of a woman and uh, regardless of the religion, it's just a, a humbling story that's inspiring people to come and visit. So with that said, I'll go light up my candles. My other candles are lit towards more peace and compassion in this world. I just want to invite you to take a moment to enjoy these old rocks and old bricks to make a prayer and a wish in your heart and to take a moment just to be in silence. With our prayers in place, we are off to explore the ancient city of Ephesus. If you like history, or even if you just like movies from ancient times, you can imagine how exciting it was to be here. Artifacts like these are usually displayed in a museum behind the glass. This is whole nother experience. It's almost overwhelming because I'm able to walk among the walls and touch the history. We just got our first lesson in how people used to use water to tell time. The city of Ephesus was one of the largest and the most important cities in an ancient Mediterranean world. It was one of the oldest Greek settlements on the Aegean Sea and later the provincial seat of Roman government in Asia. Situated at the end of the Royal Road, the city was a western terminus of east-west trade with one of the most important Mediterranean harbors for exporting products to Greece, Italy, and the rest of the Roman West. Many of the great ruins in Ephesus today were completed during the reigns of Caesar Augustus, and his successor, Tiberius. City expanded and grew on a grand scale during the reigns of Augustus to about 180 AD. During this time, sites such as a famous theater were re-ramped and new Roman sites like Odeon and the library were built. The heart of the Ephesus was the market square which acted as a hub for the trade that arrived in the city from across the empire. A legend says that the city was founded by Amazons in the third millennium BC. The Amazons were a race of women warriors who lived in Anatolia. According to Epic of Odyssey, Amazons fought with the Trojans against the Mycenaeans and Spartans in a Trojan War. At that time, their queen was killed by a Greek hero, Achilles. According to the legend, Amazons were furious women fighters. They were very good in arching, and to be faster, used to amputate their right breasts. But as we all know, there are also Amazons in South America in Brazil today. I just learned that they got their name by a German traveler who in 17th century 
saw the woman warriors alongside the river among the rainforest. He named them Amazons because they were similar to the ones mentioned in the epics of Homer. The Ephesus features two theaters, the smaller one called Odeon and the Great Theater. The Great Theater of Ephesus is splendidly preserved and is a very impressive building. This structure, built of marble, has a width of 145 meters, and its audience once reached up to 30 meters. And during its glory days, it could accommodate up to 24,000 spectators. Acoustics were phenomenal here, and I was very interested to see the bottom part of the theater, as well as the intricate work in a white marble. It was so amazing to sit here and to let the history unfold right in front of me. <laughs> You could spend years learning about the history of Ephesus and the eras through which it lived. I'm very glad we have a tour guide who is giving us some guidance. This is Trajan's temple. He is one of the uh, most powerful emperor of Roman emperors. And he had the uh, largest uh, empire in uh, Roman time. So the borders was uh, till India. So, you know, wherever you go in the world, in England, in Turkey, in Romania, in Italy, you have one uh, temple called Hadrian or Trajanus. Okay. So, uh, you see there is a kind of ball, yes. you see it's a kind of a round, and you can see there are two different feet. One is nearby it, one is on it. So, in this time, do you know that uh, this, this is built at 1st century AD? Do you know in this time the world was round? They knew that at this time? People were claiming that, but they cannot prove, prove it in that time. So, the reason why because uh, they cannot observe, they cannot travel all around. But what happened? Galileo Galileo at 16th century, he proved it, right? Because people, uh, for example, United States, who discovered Christopher Columbus? Yeah, supposedly. <laughs> Someone else before Christopher. Viking. Four years ago. Yeah, by mistake. Who was that? Vikings, maybe? No. No, no. There was one another guy, but I don't remember the name. Yeah, but, but four years ago, somehow they found it. But uh, Christopher Columbus, let's say he is the first. It, that happened at 16th century, after even Galileo. Uh, so, and then people said uh, the world is round. But before that, you know, uh, Thales. Anaximenes, Anaximandros, uh, there are many, many uh, philosophers, they claim it because, for example, Taylor said that the first arche, the first atom of the world is water, and he says that uh, the world is moving on the water, that's why earthquake happens, but his students, Anaximenes and Anaximandros, were against him, and then they said that the world is hanging in the air. That's why the sun can turn around. That was the one first idea, first claim. So that's why. And do you know what? Uh, he's saying that I am controlling world. Okay. I am the okay. emperor of the world. Okay. <laughs> the world is at my feet. We might say, we might say that. Yeah. Despite its age and everything that it's been through, city is very much still alive. The colors, shapes, and forms very much continue to tell the story of once vibrant city. Our next stop is a famous temple of Hadrian. This temple, once dedicated to the Emperor Hadrian, is considered one of the best preserved and most beautiful structures in Ephesus. The facade has four Corinthian columns that support a curved arch. Inside the temple, above the door, Medusa stands with ornaments of acanthus leaves. On both sides are friezes depicting the everyday life and the history of the city. 
The temple of Hadrian has recently been renovated. The statues and friezes have been replaced with replicas of the originals. Left side and up there, there is a wild boar and the horse. Mm -hmm. uh, in Greek lands, uh, there was one king which is called Kodros. He had four sons and one of them is called Androclos. And uh, when he Kodros died, uh, one of his sons went to Delphi temple and asked for uh, his curse, uh, the oracle. Right across from the Hadrian Temple is a public bathhouse, still radiating with vibrant mosaics. Also, a public toilet. Can you picture yourself doing your morning routine while saying hello to the stranger next to you? We are continuing in the footsteps of ancient Greeks and Romans. We are off to visit one of the first libraries ever built in the world. Built in 117 AD, the library is one of the most beautiful structures in Ephesus. This was the third richest library in ancient times. I wish we could stay longer, but for now we gotta depart because we have so much more to explore. After visiting one of the Christian shrines, the House of Mary, our next stop was a local mosque. Today, Turkey is predominantly Islamic country. To enter, I needed a proper attire. I am a Serb by nationality, and my country, Serbia, was occupied by Ottoman's empire for over five centuries. I feel fortunate to be born in times when these religious wars are behind us, so that I am able to forge friendships based on human character, not on a religion. When we are born, we don't choose if we're going to be born into Christianity, Islam, Buddhism, or Hinduism. But what we can choose is to be more open-minded and more tolerant towards other religions. I like to believe that each religion is promoting a positive spiritual growth, self-improvement and embetterment. If we could understand and accept that about each other, maybe it would be easier to find a middle ground. I am a firm believer that next generations will navigate through these waters much more successfully than we have done throughout the history. So the um, beautiful thing that we just learned is that um, right next to each other are three different religions exercising their faith in peace. And how beautiful is that? Artemis culture, Artemis cult, paganism, and then uh, Christian people came here and they built the basilica at 5th century in the name of St. John, Justinianus time, and uh, Isa Bey, Beylik's time. And Isabe came here and ordered to build a mosque. So they get to they go, uh, went to Ephesus and took some recycling material and they built this mosque. And these posts are from the recycled material. Right? Yes. You can see the text. It's Ionic and Corinthian together. Yeah, mixed yeah, one. Yeah. Are the people about to walk around? Mm, of course. Yes. If you take your shoes. Are you allowed to sit down and take a moment? Yes, 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 yes. yes. Is there a particular section that one can, can go and cannot? No. No one is praying, so no. Humanity has fought religious wars for centuries. Just recently, during the 1993, my former countries of Serbia and Bosnia-Herzegovina forged another religious war between Christians and Muslims. Sadly, after four years of fighting and many casualties, they have decided once again that they are better off living together. Despite recent wars and the five-century-long brutal occupation by Ottoman's empire over Serbia, I continue to nurture my relationships with my Muslim friends. Promoting more compassion, understanding and tolerance is truly the only way forward. 
Today, the world needs us all, as we have far more important issues to address than who's right and wrong. I want to believe that eventually, world will unite in the same wish and the same prayer. <laughs> Traveling is such an eye-opener and sometimes the best education you can get. While I wish we can stay in Turkey, it is our time to return home and go back to the recipe we started earlier. Now that I'm back, I'm very excited to try to make this candied pumpkin dessert. One of the things that I liked about it is its, its taste. It was absolutely delicious. But another wonderful thing about it is that it's so simple to make and it's really natural. So basically all you have in a recipe is pumpkin or squash in our case, sugar and walnuts. Now our cream is optional. Kaimak, as you saw, we served it with kaimak. That's something that we're gonna try to recreate here because it's hard to find Turkish kaimak in US, but we're gonna try to copy it by using some cream cheese and combining it with the whipped cream. So basically, I want to show you how this is done and I particularly want to show this to you kids because it's such a simple recipe and you guys can make it. And it's made with uh, uh, pumpkin as I said. There are no, there's no flour, there's, uh, there are no artificial flavors, colors, preservatives or anything. Basically, fruit, sugar, and walnuts and that's it so let's let's get started first step is preparing pumpkin or squash for roasting in addition to being all natural and easy to digest and process in our bodies butternut squash is loaded with all kinds of vitamins and minerals it has loads of vitamin a almost 450 percent of the suggested daily intake i would suggest that while you're watching this episode you go online and quickly check all the health benefits of butternut squash i think you will be amazed okay let's get back to a recipe through demonstrations you saw what we needed to do basically we would cut the pumpkin or the butternut squash in large pieces then we would clean the inside cut it into smaller pieces, and then peel the skin. Peeling skin can be challenging, so I would suggest that you ask for assistance. Please check with your parents every time you use sharp objects in a kitchen. Next, we're gonna set them in a baking dish and add some sugar. This time, I use refined sugar, but next time I'm gonna try to make the same dessert using honey also, another healthier alternative would be a cane or raw sugar. And now I'm just going to cover them and let them set, sit for maybe about two hours. So what we're trying to accomplish in our next step is to have the pumpkin release the fluids because the sugar will pull the uh, fluids out and it will create a syrup in which the pumpkin will later on bake. So we can leave this aside for another couple of hours and we will come back to it and then we'll roast it. Two hours into it and now we have this juice that I was talking about, which I will just pour over the pumpkin before I set it to bake on 350 for about 45 minutes. While squash is roasting, I'm preparing a dinner. This is a veal schnitzel with vegetables and I'm using some of this squash as a thickening agent. We'll leave this recipe for the next episode, but for now, let's figure out how to make kaimak. Let's start with a cup of heavy whipping cream. Once the whipped cream is well whipped, we're going to add around three quarter of sugar. After cream cheese is well whipped, I'm gonna add some lemon zest and some vanilla. And you can do this per taste. You don't need it at all. Or you can add just the vanilla and no lemon or lemon and no vanilla. So just tailor it till your preference. 
And now we are going to slowly incorporate the whipped cream into the cream cheese. So we'll go, you know, about a cup, cup and a half at a time. Because all we're trying to accomplish here now is to get a thicker consistency to uh, imitate that uh, consistency of kaimak and thick cream that we would normally find in Turkey. If you ask me, this is about the consistency of that kaimak that I was uh, talking about. And I think if we leave it just like this, this would be ideal, it would be perfect. But I will go ahead and make it just a, a little bit lighter by adding uh, all the whipped cream that we prepared. So basically you can do half a, um, a cream cheese, which is four ounce, and just a, a good cup and a half of already whipped cream. But I'm going to make it thinner and I'm going to go ahead and add another portion of whipped cream. So eventually we're going to end up with a much lighter uh, cream than the one we had in Turkey. But um, I'm doing this purposely and I'm leaving it to you to choose what works best for you. done I'm gonna set it in a fridge along with the uh, um, squash and let it chill before we serve it now that it's chilled well it's time to serve it and we're gonna take our sweet time doing it even a simple dessert like this deserves its proper time I'm gonna serve our candied squash on a cold plate and then I'm gonna pour a little bit of this syrup over it. But before I do it, I'm gonna add just a touch of lemon juice. I'm going with lemon just because I wanna add a little bit more flavor to this dessert and some of that lemon tanginess. By the way, I did not taste any lemon flavor when I was trying this dessert in Turkey. Here comes cream, nice and chilled. We're just gonna add it on top and then we're gonna decorate the dessert with the crushed walnuts. So incredibly simple and yet so amazingly delicious. If you decide to make it, I promise you, you're gonna fall in love with this dessert just as I did. This will be all for today's episode. Thank you so much for spending time with us and for watching our program. Our goal is to always provide you with the real media that's engaging, inspiring and educational. To find out more about our charity and this program, please visit vladevi.com. My charity is focused on reconnecting families and communities in America and beyond while promoting more quality family time over a healthy homemade meal. In addition to producing this program, Vlada Seeds of Life also offers a number of community projects. Please visit our website for more information and let us know if you and your friends would like to get involved.